All right. Good to see everybody here this evening. Welcome to the midweek service. Looking forward to a great time together tonight. Let's start by singing together, shall we? Take your songbook, turn to 323. 323, that is Standing on the Promises. All right, so let's stand together and we'll sing 323, Standing on the Promises of Christ my King. Brother Bob? On that verse together. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God. On that last, standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, great singing tonight, and uh, good to see you in church uh, this evening. Looking forward to a good service together tonight. Uh, thanks for making the effort and being here this evening. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow together in prayer. And Father, we do ask that you would meet with us here this evening. We thank you for the midweek service, and it's just what we need in the middle of the week. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together with the people of God and to sing songs like Standing on the Promises. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to stand on those promises, uh, not just on Wednesday night, but every day of the week. And Lord, I thank you for the promises you give us, and thank you, Lord, that you're always faithful and true to your promises. Lord, we love you this evening. We ask you to meet with us and to do what you would like to do in each one of our hearts and lives. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. All right, you may be seated. Turn with me, if you would, to 264, 264. He is able, he is able to deliver the on that first together. Tis the grandest theme through the ages rung. Tis the grandest theme for a mortal tongue. Tis the grandest theme that the world e'er sung. Our God is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. Though they sin oppressed, go to him. Now 
I'm going to read you a letter. Um, this is from Bob and Mary Johnston. I'll tell you a little bit about why he's not here this evening, but I wanted you to read this. This is their uh, prayer letter from May, and he said, In Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, we should allow faith to claim us as a whole, not in part. Faith is not a faculty. Faith is the whole man rightly related to God by the power of the Spirit of God. Have you ever noticed that it seems to be easy for us to have faith to ask God to save our wretched souls? But for some reason, it seems more difficult for us to have faith to trust him in the actual details of our lives. Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is a substance of things hoped for, which means that everything that we do in and by faith will always translate into substance. The first substance of your faith was your own salvation. You cannot see, actually see it with the physical eye, but you can see the changed life, which is a result of your faith in the finished work of Christ. Each time you pray in faith, the answer to that prayer is the substance of your faith. Each time you go out in faith and share the gospel of Christ with others and they accept Christ as their Savior, your faith is translated into the substance of souls added to the Lamb's Book of Life. He a few months back, I wrote about a man from Beatty Central who was a Christian reform pastor who came and assisted a class on the doctrine of salvation in our Bible college, and he got saved. His wife was also saved on visitation the very next day. Since then, he has brought several people with him to the classes on salvation from the village of San Rafael, and they too have accepted Christ as their Savior. I recently sent two men along with Pastor Rika to this village to canvas the area and to preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that resulted in 17 more souls who accepted Christ as their Savior. I prayed for over two years that God would allow me to plant a church in this village. And there's not one other Baptist church anywhere in the area. Sometimes your faith may not translate immediately into substance. But if we be still and know that he is God, it will if it is his will. There were also 12 saved in Beatty Central. 20 more were saved in the camp this month. Two were saved in Cabral, which along with the 17 from San Rafael, totals 51 souls saved this past month. Almost 27 years ago, many of you had the faith to send us as missionaries to the Haitian people. We went by faith, and now our faith collectively is translated into the substance of even more souls saved and added to your account, which we give God all the praise, honor, and glory. And gives an update on Mary, uh, his wife, uh, who has had leukemia. Uh, she, we came stateside for Mary to have another bone marrow biopsy to make sure that her leukemia is still in remission. When we went to her oncologist, she first had blood work done, as usual, and her counts were so good this month that her oncologist decided to cancel the biopsy. Praise God. Before we turn to the field, we plan to take a couple of months to travel to the East Coast to report to a few churches, uh, which we have not been to in almost eight years. And uh, your servants for souls, uh, Bob and Mary Johnston. And um, little did he know that, and I just found out yesterday, that on June 1st, his faith became sight. And Bob Johnston was taken home to glory. Um, car accident. And uh, they were car they were driving, and uh, he was killed. Mary is okay. Um, I just, matter of fact, wanted to find out if uh, you know what arrangements we need to make for him for this evening, and tried to uh, look up some information. And that's how I found out. Called, talked to his pastor, and uh, he actually was killed on June the first. And uh, they had the service there at the church last Wednesday, June fifteenth, and uh, just. Um, it's interesting, uh, but you know what's great about him and also the Fitzsimmons who labored for 30-some years there in Haiti is that they, they planted churches, they trained pastors, they trained people, and the work continues, and it'll continue uh, even though uh, the Lord has taken this servant of God to heaven. Uh, delightful, delightful man. And I remember him when he was here. I think we were one of those churches eight years ago he came to. I remember him uh, and his wife and uh, just a fruitful, fruitful ministry. So um, 
He is uh, in our service, but he's looking from the grandstands tonight, okay? And uh, we, we praise the Lord for his faithfulness. Pray for Mary. Uh, she still uh, talked to the pastor, and he said she still has to go back to the Dominican Republic and tie up different loose ends and business dealings and such. It has to do with the ministry there, and uh, they've asked that uh, we continue to support her for a while until she can get get things established and get herself settled and uh, we we promised we would be glad to do that and uh, try to be a blessing to her can't imagine uh, what that would be like so um, pray for them all right pray pray for Mary particularly Johnston and pray for the church there pray for the ministries over in Haiti and Dominican Republic uh, remember those particularly tonight in prayer when we go to our prayer list all right open your prayer list up if you would anybody need one Anybody need one, didn't get one? Everybody covered? Great. All right. Uh, the coming events, of course, pray for the RU inside tomorrow night down at the prison and then right here at the church on Friday night uh, out at London on Saturday morning. And then, of course, our soul winning bus visitation at 10 a.m. here at the church. At noon, the Hambies will be renewing their vows right here and uh, be here for that. And if you signed up to be there for that, that'll be a blessing and a joy to see them. And to sign up for the picnic on July 2nd is down there, uh, Windsor Park at 4 o'clock, and then uh, follow the directions on the sign-up sheet if you would. And then, of course, July 3rd will be All-American Sunday. And then uh, coming up, July 11 through 14, is Vacation Bible School, and we'll have a uh, uh, meeting this Sunday evening for those who are going to be helping in VBS and have you sign up for what areas you'd like to help in and uh, be a part of that. Brother Hamby will be here again this year for our Bible school, and uh, we'll, we'll have an organizational meeting for that Sunday evening after the service, okay? Uh, inside on the praise reports, we uh, praise the Lord for the good report at the prisons on uh, Thursday and Saturday, uh, 33 and 18, and there were four saved at, Lon at uh, CRC and one saved at London and uh, several new men. I got a letter in the mail today from... A fellow who's in one of the facilities down at Nelsonville, and I think that's for older gentlemen. Is that accurate? I think you have to be at least 55 or older or 60 or older to go down there. And a fellow wrote me and talked about how he'd, he'd been in RU and what a blessing it's been, and he's tried a couple other programs down there, but he said he would like to get RU into that facility down there in Nelsonville. He's got 12 men ready to, ready to go, want, wanted to be a part of this. And uh, so we're going to try to find if there's anybody in that area that's close enough to possibly get in there and do an RU with those fellows. But uh, God's doing great things with that program uh, in the prisons. And then continue to pray for the different church ministries and uh, these requests that are here. And then underneath the health, uh, would you uh, make a special note of Diane Stiltner? You know, Diane went down to be with her daughter there in uh, Myrtle Beach, and she had a real rough night last night, and they took her into the hospital, and they've admitted her uh, into the hospital. A lot of abdominal pain, so they're trying to figure out what is causing that. There's a, you know, uh, like most, most things like that you don't know, you begin to eliminate things, and so they have to start with their list and try to eliminate some things, but she surely would appreciate uh, your prayers uh, for her, and uh, please keep her in prayer, and uh, I wouldn't call her, but if you have her number and you want to just send her a text, let her know you're thinking about her and you're praying for her, I know she'd appreciate that, okay? And uh, do, do that for Diane this evening, all right? And then also, uh, just just jot a note there in your prayer list if you would uh, be praying for Susan Woods here Susan just got word before church that her sister in Florida is that correct Donna uh, passed away this evening and uh, just just got the news and Donna had been ill with some issues health issues and such but this was still a uh, little bit unexpected that it would turn this this bad this quick and so uh, pray for um, Susan and pray for the family as they uh, have the loss of her sister all right we continue to pray for those in authority and for our country and our leadership our military uh, pray for these who are battling cancer uh, pray for these on our salvation list if you would and then of course the unreached people groups continue to pray for them and um, and then our missionaries and uh, we'll pray particularly for Mary Johnston tonight as uh, she adjusts to the home going of her husband and uh, yet the many things that she still has to care for and of course her own physical uh, condition 
and she battles the, the right now in remission leukemia but we pray it'll stay that way amen all right brother john polable will you come up please sir and uh, be prepared to lead us in our prayer tonight and um lift these needs up in prayer All right, and I'll pray along with Brother John as he leads it audibly, as he mentions something in prayer, you just mention right along with him and uh, unite our hearts together in prayer and ask God to hear our prayer tonight. Brother John, you lead us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us where we can come back into church and Hear the word of God preached, and we pray that you'd be the preacher as he, mess, he brings a message that we will be able to take it to our hearts and use it in our daily lives. And we do thank you for the ministries here at the church, the RU, and the great things that we have uh, hear each week from uh, those people that are dealing and, and in charge of those that, those men down there. And we ask that you to continue to Bless them and build a hedge about them until they can get in each week to hear the word of God preached. And we pray that you'd be with them now and, and throughout this week. And then we pray for the church ministries of here at the church, and we pray that each one of us would be doing that that you want us to do in the ministries here. And we pray that you'd continue to uh, work in the hearts of teachers and those that are in, in charge of uh, teaching young people and uh, older, older people, and we pray that you'd help them. And give them the wisdom and, and the understanding they need. And then we pray for this health, uh, the people that are on our health list. And then we think of Diane Stiltner. And we pray that you'd give her the comfort and uh, give the doctors that that they need to know what to do. To give her some sort of relief and get her back on her feet. And then we pray for this uh, Mary Johnson that uh, lost her husband. We just pray that you'd uh, intercede there. That you'd give her the wisdom and that that she needs to continue to go back in and tie up, tie up things in uh, Haiti. And we pray that you'd give her the health and, and the, uh, the strength and that that she needs to do this. And we thank you for their uh, years of service over there in the Republic. And, and we ask that you'd help, help her now. And we pray for uh, Su Susan Ward, uh, Ward, Wood's uh, sisters that sadly died before church. We just pray that you'd help her through this time and and that you'll give her the, the wisdom and the strength and the calm, calmness that she needs to do this and we do pray for our, our military that are in <coughs> foreign countries we just pray that you'd help them uh, as they are protecting our country and keeping uh, the stuff that should be not in it out of there and we pray that you'd give them strength and the understanding and the knowledge and we pray for our <coughs> our the authority of the president and all these that uh, senators and vice presidents and all those that do, we pray that they listen to those that are saved in the senate and the congress and that they would be able to turn them around and uh, get their uh, reviews to be the right type of a view that uh, we would like to see the country go and and uh, right now it's going in the wrong road but we know that you're in charge of this and you can do anything you want to do with it so we ask that you would help us and help the people that are in charge get to uh, get saved and want to serve you in this area. We do pray for the outreach people group, but uh, we thank you for the Bible that you've given us here, and we pray that uh, that it would be quickly that uh, we'd be able to get Bibles in their hands so they could learn, learn the, and hear the hear the Word of God preached in, in their own language. And we, we do pray that you'd be with our uh, our. Uh, missionaries that are on this list there's many many missionaries that are doing good jobs over th throughout the world and, and, and also here in the united states also and we just pray that you'd help them and give them that that they need with the finances and then also the prayers that go up to for each one of them and that uh, you would hear the prayers and that you would take care of them as they're over there and doing the word, word of god and preaching and teaching uh, all the days long and we ask you be with them now, and we pray that you'd uh, be of their service tonight, and pray that you'd bless it and give us just what we need tonight, and pray of the preacher and the singing and, and the remainder of the service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
243 in your hymnal, 243, I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Let's all stand together as we sing 243 on that first together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alone. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together. together.
I am resolved to enter the kingdom. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the path of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten to glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. All right, be seated if you will. Have the ushers come to get the offering here this evening. And um, I just thought maybe we could take an offering for Mrs. Johnson and uh, just send it to her from our church and let her know we're praying for her and um, just try to be a blessing to her during this time, all right? And so uh, let's, let's just give as generously as you can and uh, be a blessing to this dear lady. You, I, you know... I can't imagine what it'd be like to. I, I was looking. I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember. Anybody remember how long they've been married? You sent that article and it had in there how, when they got married, and I can't remember the date. But I think it was well over 30 years, and you know, to all of a sudden, and and to be in the the accident, the same accident when you know your husband was killed. That's uh, that's difficult difficult so let's be a blessing to her tonight all right let's pray for our offering father we do thank you for the this evening lord we thank you for the opportunity we have to give and lord we want to be a blessing to mrs johnston and lord we we certainly don't understand these things our ways are not your ways and our thoughts are not your thoughts but lord we do believe that all things work together for good to those who love god and certainly brother johnston is happy where he is and we know he's with the absent from the body and present with the lord lord we need you to give your grace to mrs johnston to her their children uh, to the ministries there in dominican republic and haiti and god i pray that uh, you would take the gift that we send to her and it would be a blessing it would be uh, it would meet a need and maybe take care of some things that she's been praying about maybe be an answer to one of her prayers we'd like that lord and so i pray you'd bless the gift and give her life tonight and use it for your honor and glory in jesus name we ask it amen All right, take your Bible this evening if you would. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1, please. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, 
elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture here this evening, and Father, I'm asking that you would speak to our hearts tonight as we look into your word and we understand these words that were given to these believers of that day and yet are so helpful and so enlightening for those of us who go through trials today and the trial of our faith. So open our understanding this evening in your word. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Pray you'd help me as I bring the lesson, and please help everyone as they listen. Lord, I want to be a spirit-filled teacher, and I would like them to be spirit-filled listeners. And each of us would have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to the church this evening. So help us, we pray, as we study your word together. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. I'm going to talk to you tonight on this subject, the trustworthiness of your faith. The trustworthiness of your faith. These Christians that Peter is writing to, notice it says in verse 1 that they were strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. uh, Scattered throughout this region and he calls them strangers because he's trying to remind them we're all pilgrims and strangers as we pass through this world. This world's not my home, I'm just passing through. Okay, and he's reminding them of that. They they were un, they were under uh, intense persecution. They were under some some great affliction, and what the Holy Spirit gives to Peter to give to them is verse number seven, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The the trying of your faith, he said, is more precious than gold that perisheth. That's an amazing statement. How can the trying of my faith be more precious than gold? Because gold will perish. But your faith in Christ will never perish. You'll see that as we come to the end of our lesson tonight. Faith in Christ never will. Now, the trial of faith is the proving of our faith. Alright? It's the proving of our faith. A trial is an experience. It's suffering that puts strength. It's, it's, it's it, afflictions or temptations that exercise or prove the virtues of men, such as faith. Alright? So God's going to put us through the trials to test our faith. Now, what is faith? Faith simply is, it would be taking God at His word. That's probably a simple definition of faith. Believing, in other words, you just take God at His word. We'll we'll come to that in a little bit and talk about faith. But in Reformers Unanimous, they've given us a definition of faith, and that is a personal measurement of the level of confidence that I have in what Christ has done 
and will do in, through, and for me. Now that's, that's a long one to remember if it's the first time you're hearing it. But think about this. It's, the, the person, it's, it's a personal measurement. Faith is a personal thing. It's a personal measurement of the level of confidence that I have in what Christ has done. That's what faith is. And everybody's faith is a different level. Okay, you're gonna, we're going to look at that in just a moment. We have different levels of faith, but it's that level of confidence. Now, so that personal measurement, that level of confidence, God says, I'm going to test that. I'm going to put that to the proving ground, so to speak. And I'm going to put everyone through that. Because just as gold is refined to bring the impurities up so you can pull those impurities out, our faith gets tested so God can bring those impurities and those doubts and those fears to the surface and pull them out of us. Okay? And so we're going to find, talk about the trustworthiness of our faith. Number one tonight is this. Our faith will be tried or proved. Our faith will be tried or proved. Don't think that's unusual. That's normal. Look at chapter 4 and verse 12, will you? 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Peter writes these same believers and he says this, listen, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Don't, don't think it's strange that your faith is being tried. Don't think it's strange that you're going through trials. That's normal Christianity. Think, why do I have it so hard? Everybody has it hard. Why do I have it so tough? Everybody has it tough. Why am I getting tested? Everybody gets tested. Don't think it's strange what you're going through. All right? Now, there are levels of faith. You understand that, don't you? Uh, look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4 and verse 40. Mark's second book of the New Testament, right after Matthew. Mark 4. And verse number 40. This is where the disciples go out on the ship and Jesus is asleep on a pillow in the ship. Remember when the big storm comes up? And they're trying to take care of it. But finally, they, they, they couldn't. Uh, they, 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 the ship was filling up with water and they didn't know what to do. And so they went to Jesus in Mark 4 in verse 38. It says, he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they wake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Now look at verse 40. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have... What kind of faith? No faith. Alright? Here, he, he rebukes the disciples... Because they have no faith. And by the way, there are people who live with no faith. No, no personal measurement. There's no level of confidence in Christ at all. No level of confidence in God at all. And people live that way. When the storms of life come, there's no reliance on God whatsoever. You just got to figure out how we can get through this. Got to figure out what we can do to, to beat this. We got to figure out what we can do to handle this. They, maybe they complain, maybe they worry, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll get discouraged, but they live just as if there is no God. And by the way, that can be unsaved people, obviously, but I've seen saved people react that way as well. Tragically so. And so there is no faith. But then, go, go now to your left to the book of Matthew and look at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. This is the episode again where they're in the storm and Jesus comes to them walking on the water this time. And this time in the, in the wee hours of the morning, there's one disciple on board that says, Lord, let me come walk to you on the water. Who was that? That was Peter. I want to walk on the water, okay? And of course, Jesus said, verse 29 of chapter 14, He says, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him 
and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So here's, here's someone who had little faith. Hey, you understand something? Little faith had him walking on water. If little faith could get a man to walk on water, how small must our faith be? <laughs> Think about that. There he is. In fact, Jesus said, if you had faith of the grain of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be removed to the sea, and it happened. How small our faith must be, huh? So Peter walked on water. What happens when you have little faith? Little faith gets easily distracted. Peter started walking on the water and he kept his eyes on Jesus, but then the Bible says that it's here that he, he saw the wind boisterous and he was afraid. He got easily distracted and got his eyes on something else and that caused him to begin to sink. Jesus said that's little faith. You know, little faith means it's easy to get our eyes off God and get our eyes on the circumstances of life and the troubles of life. And that causes us to doubt. Doubt what God will do. Doubt that God will come through. Doubt that God means what He says. That's little faith. Okay? Then, let's look at Mark chapter 11. Go back to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 11. So we have no faith, and then we have little faith, and then here in Mark chapter 11, they come to a fig tree, Jesus, earlier in the chapter, uh, curses the, the fig tree. In fact, start up in uh, verse number 12. Mark 11, verse 12. On the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And it goes on and talks about him going on in Jerusalem. But look at verse 20. In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Now there's just faith. There's no faith. There's little faith. Now this is just faith. What did it take to curse a fig tree and see it shrivel up and die? It just took faith. So if you just have faith, you'd see things like this. You would see God do things along this line. That's just faith. But wait, there's another level after faith. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Go back to the book of Matthew chapter 8. So we have no faith. We have little faith. We have faith. And now, here in Matthew 8, we have another situation where a centurion comes to Jesus. Verse number 5. When Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. I think that's about the only time I remember Jesus marveling at somebody else. Okay? I understand what that meant. I'll, I'll explain what he was saying in just a moment. He said to them that followed him, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so, what? Great faith. No, not in Israel. Here's a man with great faith. Why did he have great faith? In fact, not just great faith, but Jesus called it so great faith. Okay? So great faith. Because he was willing to simply obey his word. Jesus, uh, listen, I'm a man under authority. I, I have men under me. I say this and they, I say come and they come. I say go and they go. I say do this, they do that. In other words, they are subject to me. You just speak the word about that illness my servant has and I know it will leave. It will obey you. That's the authority and the power of your word. 
Jesus said, I've not seen so great faith. Great faith is just simply when you take God at His word and you say, God said it and I will believe it. And that will settle it for me. And that's the way it ought to be. Simply obey His word. Hey, I'll be faithful to the house of God because the Bible says so. End of discussion. I will give God at least a tithe of my income because the Bible says so. End of discussion. I'm going to do it because the book says so. I'm going to love other people because the Bible says so. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive because the Bible says so. See, there's no, I'm not going to put a but where God put a period. Well, I'd forgive them, but no, God says, be kind one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. God says, be loving, be merciful, be kind. I'm going to be separate from the world because the book says so. Doesn't matter what I think, doesn't matter how I see it, doesn't matter what I think, it, it doesn't matter, that, that doesn't enter into it. The book says it, that settles it. See, that is great faith. Living your life based on the words of the Master. Jesus said that's great faith. I'll tell you what, that means great faith is attainable for every one of us. Great faith is obtainable for every one of us. Now, whether you have little faith, whether you have faith, whether you have great faith, I, I'll guarantee you this, your faith is going to be proved, it's going to be tested. No doubt about it. So let's number two on your paper tonight is the trying of your faith. The trying of our faith. How will God prove us? How will God put our faith to the test? How will God begin to refine that faith to get out the impurities? So our so maybe our little faith can grow to faith and our faith can grow to great faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to do what? To please God. And the just shall live by faith. So God uses several things. Number one, He uses adversity. Adversity. Who's our example in this? Job. Job is our example. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 sheep, 7 sons, 3 daughters. And in one day, all of it's taken away. My friend, you've had bad days. You've not had a bad day like that day. Business has failed. Financially ruined. Workers killed. Children killed. The friends that he had came to him and then eventually turned on him and gave him all kinds of bad advice and bad counsel. And I, I, I don't know that Job... Uh, Job may have been like us, and he may have been far above us. Because God said, have you considered my servant Job? I think if that had been you or me, we'd have said, what is going on? What is going on? Why is all this happening to me? can tell you, when you have things not rising to that level, but you've had some days where, where though it doesn't rise to that level, you thought about Job. And you've thought those words, what is going on? Lord, why am I going through this? I'll tell you why you're going through this. Your faith is being tested. Your faith is being tested. The fire of adversity is purging out the impurities in your faith. And listen, welcome that. Welcome that. I think Job knew it. Look at, can you turn back to Job real quick? You can turn back there even if it isn't real quick, I guess. But Job 23. Job 23. You know what he said in verse 10? Job said, but he knoweth the way that I take. 
And when he hath tried me, when he hath what? Tried me. Job says, he's trying my faith. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. God's going to remove those impurities. He's going to get the dross out, and I'll come forth as gold. That's how you handle adversity in your life. Several years ago at the RU conference in Rockford, Illinois, that, that was the theme of the whole conference. You know what it was? Adversity, university. Adversity, university. That's where you go to school, in the school of adversity. And God purifies your faith. He proves your faith. And He'll use adversity to do it. Okay? That's what's happening. Will you say with Job, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold? There's a second thing that God uses to try our faith, and that is sacrifice. Sacrifice. The example for this would be Abraham asked to sacrifice Isaac. Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22. God comes to Abraham. By the way, Isaac, the son of promise, Isaac, the son that was born when Abraham's 100 and Sarah's 90. And it came to pass after these things, God did tempt, or God's testing Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I, am, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for a burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. And he, you know the story, he goes up to the sacrifice Isaac and he has him on the altar and he lifts the knife up and at the last possible moment the Lord calls him from heaven, the angel of the Lord, and says, Abraham, Abraham, and he stops. What he says is verse 12, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Your faith may be tested by God asking you, are God saying to you, are you willing to give up? that which is of great value to you? Are you willing to give up that which is of great value to you? Sometimes God may call you to give up something that you have embraced and you become very valuable and important to you. I think the, 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 the phrase, take thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Could it be that Abraham was beginning to love Isaac and have his affection on Isaac more than he did on God? Is that what God was testing to see? Maybe God is in the process of you having give up something very dear to your heart. It may be a person. It may be a hobby. It may be a job. It may be a relationship. It may be a possession. I don't know what it would be, but your faith is being tried in that way. And you have to ask yourself the question, do I love God? Or do I love what God has given to me? Which do I love more? There are many people who, they, they love God until God begins to take some things away that are of value to them, and then they shake their fist at God. And then they get upset with God. And all that does, listen, it just revealed, God reveals their heart that they were loving the gift more than they were the giver. And parents, this is especially difficult in, as a parent. We have to remember that we love our children and we can, we're to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but we must remember that children are a heritage of the Lord. 
that our children do not belong to us, they belong to God. We are entrusted with their care. And He gives them to us. The fruit of the womb is His reward. We have to remember that as Abraham did, willing to give that back to God if God asks us to. And if God does, so chooses to do. Sacrifice. It'll test your faith. It'll test your faith in God. Adversity. Sacrifice. There's a third thing that God will allow to come into our life to prove our faith, and that's also in the book of Genesis, and that's temptation. Look at Genesis 39 with me, please. Genesis 39. This example is Joseph. Joseph in particular with Potiphar's wife. Joseph, as you know, was brought down into Egypt after his brothers had sold him as a slave. The Bible says in Genesis 39, verse 1, Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him oversee over his house, and all that he had, had he put into his hand. And he talked about how God blessed him because God blessed Joseph. And verse 6 says, He left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. Joseph was a goodly person, well favored. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is it with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph, what's the next three words, church? Day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her to be with her. It came to pass about that time Joseph went in the house to do his business. There was none of the men of the house there within. She caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. It came to pass when she saw that she had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, she called unto the men of the house, spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. She laid his garment upon by her until his Lord came home. She said the same thing unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto me came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment with me and fled out. And of course, he got upset and he ended up throwing Joseph in prison. And Joseph spent three years in prison for that. Notice the temptation. Day after day, she was tempting him. Day after day, you may face that temptation at work. Day after day, temptation of something that's forbidden. Maybe something on the computer. Maybe television. Maybe a friend that, that continually wants you to do something you know you shouldn't do. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's greed. Maybe it's evil thoughts. But listen, even temptation can prove our faith. And it can, it can try our faith as to whether we'll keep our faith in God. Will we maintain the level and confidence in God? Why? There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And He will, with the temptation, provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear. Have the faith in God that there's always a way to escape. The trustworthiness of your faith is being tested in temptation. And Joseph passed the test. He fled and he did not sin against God. So how does God prove our faith? He does it with adversity. 
He does it with sacrifice. He does it with temptation. But he also may use evil workers. He may use evil workers. Now that's in the book of Daniel chapter 6. You don't have to go there, but Daniel 6, most of you know this story. In Daniel 6, there were three other presidents and they were they really wanted to get, because the king thought it set Daniel over everybody. They didn't want that. And so they set out to find something wrong with Daniel. Something against the king, against something that they could bring charges against him. And they couldn't find anything. Except he prayed to God three times a day. Three times a day he knelt in his room and his window opened towards Jerusalem and he prayed to God. Now they're in Babylon. And he would pray to the Lord. They didn't like Daniel's faith. That was the issue. And here's the temptation. And here's, here's what evil workers... We're, we're like Daniel. You know what? We're in a strange land. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. We're around strange people who, who serve strange gods and they do strange things. And, and the more you go closer to God, the more stranger the world will become. The temptation for the believer is to join in. Temptation is to be like them. Tired of dressing different. Tired of listening to the different. Can't listen to that music they like. Can't watch the things they like to do. Can't do the things they like to do. How come we have to be different? And Christians get weary. And Christians, Christians, by the way, Christians cave in and just become like the world. Grow weary of being in the minority. But Daniel didn't. It's an amazing thing. Daniel didn't grow weary. Daniel stood for what's right. He still prayed three times a day, even though they passed a decree saying nobody could ask anything, uh, any petition but of the king. Can we, could we maybe draw a conclusion from that, that possibly the way to keep your faith intact and the way for your faith to stand against the evil of the day and not to succumb to the evil that's around us, is to spend time with God. Not just, not just uh, spend time with God you know, for a few minutes in the morning and then forget about Him the rest of the day until you go back and have your devotions tomorrow morning. No, but to take God with you all day long. David said, evening and morning and at noon while I pray. Daniel prayed three times a day. I, it might have been, he might have been following David's song. And doing it evening, morning, and at noon. But he was spending time with God. We, the average Christian, that you know, when we talk about reading the Bible or studying the Bible, to memorize the Bible, to meditate on the Bible, the average, mostly what you hear in churches is preachers just urging people to read the Bible. And most Christians won't even do that. And if they do, it's a page or two or a proverb or a psalm and then they're good. And so you maybe spend five minutes or ten minutes a day with the Lord and, and the other, and, and if you spend eight hours sleeping, you, you spend about 15 to 16 hours being influenced by the things of the world. And we wonder why we're not spiritual. We wonder why we have such a, a pull for the things of the world. You know, you will become like the people you hang around. Whenever, you know, you, you, every parent here knows if their child is, if you're in a, a, a sports league around unsaved kids or they're in a, a public school, you can tell when they're hanging around the wrong, crowd, wrong kids. How can you tell? Their behavior changes. They become like the people they hang around. So do you and I. And so you want to hang around the Lord. Spend time with God. D.L. Moody said, Sin will keep you from this book 
or this book will keep you from sin. Who do you spend time with? Hmm? Who do you spend time with? It tries, he's, evil workers will try your faith. They'll try your faith. God will allow that to happen. Now, all that takes place, there's no doubt about it, but the third point and the question is this, why does God test our faith? Why does God do it? You know why? Because we present our faith to Christ. We present our faith to Christ. Go back to 1 Peter again, chapter 1, would you please? 1 Peter chapter 1, where we started this evening. Notice, the trial of your faith, verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory when? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. When we see Christ. When we see Christ, we're going to be able to, to, to give our faith to Him and He's going to say, I want it to be found unto pr- honor, praise, and glory. Honor, honor is the esteem you hold for somebody else. When you honor somebody, you, you hold them in, in high esteem. Praise is expressing or declaring that honor. It's you verbally saying how much you esteem them and honor them. Glory is the luster with which a person so honored will shine in heaven. It's been when when you glory when 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 we glorify God, we put God in a good light. We shine the light on God. That's why whether we eat or drink, what's what we do, we're to do all to the glory of God. We're to do everything to shine the light on God, not to shine the light on us. Because without Him. We can do nothing. It all belongs to Him. And so our faith does that. So the more my faith has been tested and proved here, the brighter I can shine for Jesus there. How great would that be? Testing, hey, testing here brings glory over there. Paul talked about this. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Would you turn there, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Notice with me verse 15. Verse 15. You all right? Are you there? For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, to shine the light on God, okay? For the which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, okay, that that proving, that testing that we're going through right now, that is proving our faith, it's only for a moment because our life is but a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Because we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but things which are not seen are eternal. Listen, our faith is proved trustworthy now so we may be praiseworthy later. That's what God's doing. That's why He tests us. That's why He proves us. He wants to be able. He wants us to... The temptation, the, 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 when we go through trials, when we go through adversity, when we go through uh, the, 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 the things that we, God will use to test our faith, the, the problem is we, we tend to keep our eyes down here and not lift our eyes to what is the eternal weight. What's the eternal value of what's going on here? We tend to just look at it right now. Why am I going through this? Why do I have it so hard? Why is it so difficult for me? How come I this? How come I that? How come it? 
And we're looking at ourselves. We're looking at it right here. And instead of looking up and saying, God, accomplish your plans in my life. When you have tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Prove my faith, the trustworthiness of my faith. I pray that each of us would desire that our faith would be found unto honor and praise and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. And Lord, I pray that each of us would understand that you're not a God that's afar off. You're a God that is active in our lives. Jeremiah, you showed him the vision of the potter and the clay. He got him to the potter's house and, and, and you ask him, can I not do with Israel, with you, as this potter does to the clay? And I realize, Lord, that you're hands-on in our life. You're, you're, you're making us into vessels of honor. and You prove the trustworthiness of our faith. Lord, try our faith. And as we go through the different means by which you'll try our faith, may it be found unto honor and praise and glory. Lord, keep us with an eternal perspective, not an earthly perspective. Our life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. But eternity is forever. Oh, help us live with eternity in view and not with just time in view. Lord, I pray that you'll you've encourage people tonight that some are going through some of these trials right now. And they'll understand that God's proving the trustworthiness of my faith. Job even got to where he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Lord, I pray, give us that kind of faith in God. Increase our faith. And may we please you with our lives. Now, Father, dismiss us with your care. Make us mindful you go with us from this place. May others see Christ in us this week. Help us to give the gospel as we go. See souls saved and Christians encouraged in the Lord. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground. Let's sing that together, shall we? I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet higher ground. God bless you. You are dismissed. Choir, come right on up.